Welcome back. This is the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host, Nick Filato. Tonight we're here for Mailbag Part 2. We did Part 1 last night. We didn't get to nearly all the questions, so we have a lot more coming in. And so we're going to answer them all today. Our first question on Part 2 comes from Extend Julian Love. And he asks, or she, looks like a he, had Aziz Ojolari not missed any time, what do you think his stat line would realistically look like? And would his presence have led to a few more wins? I don't know if his presence, Dan, would have led to a few more wins because Aziz Ojolari has played in quite a few losses. Obviously, that's not corollary with Aziz Ojolari's play because he's had a pretty profound impact on the defense. But he played against Dallas in week three, Chicago in week four, which was a win. And then he returned in what the commander's game that was a tie and then now he's played in the eagles game and i don't believe he played in any other games to this season so i don't know if it would have resulted in any wins but in terms of the stat line that's where it really gets interesting because right now aziz ojalari has four sacks 13 pressures i'm imagining he has just as many if not maybe more pressures than Kayvon Thibodeau which i believe Thibodeau i don't have the stats in front of me is that 38 pressures right now yeah, with that's right i think a decent amount more sacks. Like we're talking like eight sacks. I think it would be somewhere around there. I think Aziz Ojolari, the way he has looked as a pass rusher, it's improved from last season. We've said that several times on the podcast, but I do, however, still feel like those the liability and run defense is still kind of there. And I think opposing offenses know it too. And they're running at him. And that's something that keeps popping up on film. So despite the fact that he added 10 pounds, he looks bendier. His hand usage is much more prompt. And I would say he has more pass rushing moves than he did in his rookie season, I still think he needs to develop his ability to set the edge and be a consistent run defender. Yeah, I would agree with Nick. I think he's right on, on the mark with the stat line. I think it could even be double digit sacks. I think most of what you've seen improvement wise from Ojolari is as a pass rusher. Nick talked about the hand usage that's taken a massive jump. The bendiness is interesting, but as a run defender, it's almost like he either is the same or went backwards. The last game, the Eagles really picked on him. Washington showed it a couple times on tape, and I think that's what the Eagles picked apart and saw and knew they could take advantage of. So I don't know if they'd win any more games with him on the field. I think the run defense would be worse. The pass defense would be better. Um, so, yeah, that's my answer there. DK from BK asks, it's unknowable, but where do you think Joe Shane thinks we are with the rebuild? It seemed like this was, from, this was a start from ground zero rebuild. Take our dead cap. Uh, year after cutting so many vets, but have we won more? Uh, but we have won more than we expected. Should we build on this, or do we do major surgery? I think you build on it because if you look at the core of the roster, Dan, you have Dexter Lawrence, you have Xavier McKinney, you have possibly Julian Love as a long term fixture. The interesting parts are Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley. We talked about that a lot on the first mailbag. I'm sure we'll talk about it on this mailbag as well, but I think you have a good core of players. So I wouldn't say major surgery is required, but you need some sort of surgery because you need to build this entire roster from a depth standpoint which is probably the biggest issue that, and there's not top end talent at certain positions, i.e. linebacker and wide receiver. So there's definitely some overhauling that needs to take place, but I do think there is a solid foundation here for Joe Shane to work with. Yeah. I don't think you should just get rid of your core to get rid of your core. Like someone like Andrew Thomas, who's under 25 years old and an elite left tackle. You never get rid of that. Someone like Dexter Lawrence, same boat. Don't get rid of that. Xavier McKinney's another example. There's too many guys like that, that you wouldn't want to start from ground zero. Now, if he wants to start from ground zero at quarterback and running back, I am going to understand it, to be completely honest. That is not out of the realm. I'm not, I don't look at this like we need to definitely get better in 2023 from what we were in 2022. I'm again looking towards 2025. I always will be looking toward it until we become a Chiefs type team. Then, if we're that, then keep all the guys, you know, pay them, keep them, hope they stay healthy, yada, yada. But until then, I can understand any route that he wants to go, Joe Shane. If that means starting over at quarterback and running back and taking some losses in 2023 and not having a great season and not having a better season in 2022, personally, I'm okay with that. I know it's going to suck. I don't want to go through the film again, Nick, on a bad season with bad quarterback play and bad team, but I can accept it if it's a means to an end, and we'll see if that's the case. Joseph Davis asks, I'm a bit late with this question, but with all the problems the Giants have had versus counters, is there a way to extract all counter plays the Giants have defended since game one and put them together on one clip? I've easily done this with other programs. Don't know if it's possible here. Uh, just clips or clips and breakdown. Uh, we're not going to have time to do that, I don't think. Right. 
No, I don't believe so. And it would be hard to re- really get all the counter plays in, in one location. And it would definitely wouldn't fit into a two minute time frame. Yeah. If because you want to do so that many teams run counter against it. like oh, all the look, counter just from the last you upgrade to Twitter blue and buy your check mark, Nick, you get like a <laughs> five minute video window. I think you get a longer video window. Yeah. I think I saw that in El Jefe's video. <laughs> yeah. It was defending. And, and um, yeah, it's a good idea, Joseph. It would be interesting. We'd learn a lot. If you know how to do it, like you said, you said it can easily be done, uh, do it for us and then send it to us and we'll try to upload it in pieces on Twitter or something like that. Or Nick can try that. I don't know. Maybe we'll put it on YouTube. We can we can go from there. All right. Crypto Fariz asks, in 2016, Victor Cruz came back from injury and looked serviceable to me. Did not make the 2017 roster. Kenny Galloway looks okay to me physically. With your analysis, do you think he is physically compromised at this point? Because Because I can't tell. I think he definitely looks slower than he did back in 2019. You know, that was a long time ago, though. And then 2020, he spent that entire season injured. Comes over to the Giants 2021 after some surgery. And then we learned early in this season that he had 2022 surgery. So he has a lot of surgery under his belt. He's not getting any younger. I, I think he looks a step slower and a step more or less explosive. I don't think he ever really was an overly explosive wide receiver, but it does seem like he is lacking the juice that we saw back in his Detroit days. I would have to agree with Nick on this. It's not the same player that Nick and I got a little excited over, maybe too excited over in 2019 when the Giants signed or 2020 offseason after the 2019. Uh, I do think there was like some glimmer of hope. He ran a route last week where it was like interesting. Like it was an interesting vertical route. He had a really good release. He stacked. I was like, okay, this looked pretty good. But then like he runs a whip route and it's like this dude looks like he's 86 years old running. And I know that's not his route. Like that never what he's been good at, but if you look that bad running any route on the field, to me, it's probably a sign of you're not physically where you once were because starting NFL receivers don't run routes like that. And the Giants have had two big bodied receivers of the similar prototype of Kenny Galladay on this roster this year Colin Johnson and Isaiah Hodgins. And to call a spade a spade, both of those guys look a lot more explosive and a lot more effective on the football field. And it sucks yeah. to hear that because this guy's getting paid so much money. But if you watch Isaiah Hodgins, he knows this offense. He knows where to be against certain coverages. I just did a piece on Big Blue View about Isaiah Hodgins. By the time this episode drops, go and check it out. You'll see what I'm talking about in terms of his football IQ and his release package off the line of scrimmage and how deceptive he is with some of his double moves. I mean, that goes back to his time in Buffalo. And I don't think Kenny Galladay necessarily has the same type of skill set to do that. Now, he did pull off that nice double move against uh, Philadelphia and James Bradbury, where he did get open. It took a little bit of time, but you can watch those two clips between Isaiah Hodgins double move and Kenny Galladay's, although they are different routes, you can just see there's a different level of speed and um, an ability to sell with Isaiah Hodgins than there is with Kenny Galladay. Yeah, I would completely agree with that too. And I'm, and I like Hodgins. That's part of it. Okay. Robbie Sel- Selarwick asks, or salary arc. Asks, I, I let you take that one. I was going to jump on the grenade and I was like, nah, son, not, not this salary one. rack asks, <laughs> what's the plan for the slot on Sunday night? Sl- could we do, could we see Slayton in the slot and with Galladay and Hodgins on the outside? Now, I'm actually not hundred percent certain what the plan will be. If Richie James does not clear the protocol, I'm going to pull up Darius Slayton's slot snaps right now. I'm imagining he's going to be at least considered in that role right now. He has played 100 snaps in the slot and mostly it's been since the Detroit game. So it really kind of upticked after the bye week. That's when also Richie James got injured during that Seattle game. So maybe they started like saying, Hey, let's use Darius Slayton here. Wondell Robinson ended up getting hurt against Detroit. So I don't really have a definitive answer. If I had to guess, I think it would be probably that, but I don't think Kenny Galladay is going to go out there and just play 35, 40 snaps. I still think they're going to mix in some other players. It's just who exactly and who's going to get promoted from the practice squad. Are they going to actually finally promote Pimpleton? Are they going to get Mickens up there who they just signed to their practice squad? He's been here for a cup of coffee. I don't think that's realistic. So I'm not firmly, I don't have a firm grasp on exactly what is going to happen. I'm excited to see what it is though. It's an interesting question because I think in general, Nick's right. It's not going to be like Galladay on the field for every snap. You'll see some Marcus Johnson in there. You're going to see a ton of 12 personnel and 13 personnel, I think, again, with the jumbo tight end at times, meaning just an extra offensive lineman. But having said that, one thing that stands out to me is the Giants aren't really your traditional team when it comes to the slot receiver. It's not like they're running like the old Ben McAdoo style system or the Shermer, or even just thinking back to some of those old systems, where there's like two receivers on the outside and a traditional slot in between one of them. It's a lot of stacked 
uh, tight formations to the line of scrimmage, a lot of trips, bunches type looks with, with the three receivers and the one on the other side. And it's just like, so there isn't really a traditional slot in this offense, in my opinion, but it makes sense that Slayton would do it. I don't think Hodgins will do it. I don't think Galladay will do it though. Galladay, I think could be interesting in this slot um, potentially, but um, I'm, I'm yeah, looking at it right now, Dan, yeah. sorry to cut you off. No, Marcus Johnson hasn't really played in the slot this year. Yeah. David Sills did in the beginning of the year, but David Sills hasn't really seen the football field all that often. And then Kenny Galladay has 14 total snaps this season in the slot. So Darius Slayton at 100 is is a much more is a receiver who has a lot more experience in the slot right now. I just don't know if they're going to feel comfortable enough to promote one of these guys that we haven't seen yet. Somebody who can mm -hmm. offer something different. They might need to if Richie James isn't there just to be the punt returner. But is that guy going to be comfortable enough in this offense to play an offense? I don't really know. Yeah, me either. Kevin Donahue asks McKinney and Jackson injuries are analogous or analogous. I can't believe I can't pronounce that word. I don't know how to pronounce that word. Anal. Anal what? Analogous. Analogous is definitely how you pronounce that word. Analogous to Plaxico in 08 in that they were self-inflicted and derailed the key to success for a season. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I can understand what you're saying. Plex goes was a little bit different. You have a weapon. I think it was in a nightclub, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and you accidentally shoot yourself. That's different than a guy, Xavier McKinney, just trying to enjoy himself and maybe getting a little reckless on an ATV in Cabo. And in terms of Adore Jackson, Jackson did absolutely nothing wrong in that scenario. That was the coaching staff putting him into a position where he could feel the punt. And it's uh, to me, it was a, a bad decision to do that as a coaching staff, but I'm not going to blame Jackson for that whatsoever. Yeah, agreed. It's also, it is analogous in the sense of like what you're referring to, but it's the teams are not analogous whatsoever. The 08 team was the best roster the Giants have had in my lifetime by a wide margin. This roster, you know, I know Sean, a few people said earlier this season they could make a wild card run just like 07, but those people just completely overlooked the actual strength of the roster from a depth standpoint, from an offensive line overall standpoint, from everything standpoint. So, it's just not similar rosters in that sense. But, but other felt, than that, it is. Enough. I felt like we understood that too, Dan, like going into the season, like just as a Giants fan base, like no one was saying the Giants were going to win 10, 11 games. And everyone was saying, yo, if the Giants suffer one injury in the secondary, yeah. they're screwed. If they suffered we one injury, that here, was an issue from the start. That's the problem. We were never confident in the linebacker position. Like it's not like we, we had delusions of grandeur about this team. It was just nice that they ripped off a seven and two start. But Dan, Jim Henry. Jim Henry asks, how many keepers do you guys think we have right now? I think we have six on defense. Thibodeau, Ojolari, Dexter Lawrence, Xavier McKinney, Adoree Jackson, and Julian Love. I don't think Leonard is a keeper anymore. And we also have three on offense. Bellinger, Andrew Thomas, and Evan Neal. Writing it down makes me realize that we need a lot of help. Ha ha. Yeah, I'm uh, working through all of those. I think all nine of those players are keepers. Some are built more building blocks than others. For example, KT, Ojolari, Dexter Lawrence, Thomas, um, Evan Neal, hopefully, Bellinger, I think for sure. As far as like Dory Jackson goes, he's a little older with more of an injury history, and he's already passed that first rookie contract. Julian Love, I like. I don't love as much. I think Love is a solid player. I don't think he's that. I don't think he's like a – he's a keeper because it's worth just keeping the guys in-house. And he's like a good leader and he's obviously like pretty solid on the field. I'm not too overly impressed with love though. Personally, I don't think he's like anything too special. I think he does a lot of dirty work. I think he plays hard. It's fine, whatever, but he's not like if they like, if they didn't resign him, I wouldn't go crazy personally, but I hope they do because he's worth resigning. You should resign your in-house guys. So he's considered a keeper in that sense. But if we're just talking pure keepers, right, we're not talking building blocks. Then I would also consider Leonard Williams a keeper too, because of his contract. They already kicked back a ton of his contract to next year because, well, frankly, Joe Shane had no options. He couldn't sign the rookie class without further pushing back cap hits on the only two options he had, a Dory Jackson, Leonard Williams. That just gives you a scope of how detrimental Dave Gettleman's salary cap structure was. It was among the worst we've ever seen from that standpoint. It left Joe Shane with no option. So he had to do the only actual option or left him with the only option to take. One option. He had it. You have to take it. So I wouldn't want to cut Leonard next year. Like I'm okay cutting Kenny Galladay, Nick, and like taking on such a massive dead cap hit, but I don't want to also add a Leonard Williams dead cap hit to that. If it means I don't get Saquon Barkley, I'm perfectly fine with that. 
Yeah, I think I'm right there with you. And in terms of Julian Love, look, Julian Love, I don't feel like has the upside of a Xavier McKinney. I think he is a player that you want on your defense. I also think he is being asked to do a lot right now. And is that unfair yeah. for him? I don't know if unfair is the right word to quantify that, but I think he had like, if you watch the tape and I know you do, man, he's in the box all the time. He's next play. He is playing the deep half. He's literally wearing every hat that a secondary piece can play on a team that wants to run a lot of quarter, meaning he's going to be aligned where a linebacker typically is on third and long situations. And I think that's difficult, man, just to know exactly sure. where you have to be in every single cer certain situation. I just really appreciate and value how smart he is. And I think that's he, what I really, yeah. As and long I as he's willing to take a contract that reflects that type of player, I'm all good with it. And I think he will too. I, I don't think he thinks he's going to reset the safety market yeah. or anything. Or anything like that. Yep. Curmudgeon 68 asks, I was wondering, since you said the Giants use Barkley in the backfield on passing downs, mostly to pick up blitzes, why don't they line up a guard in the backfield to do that and split Barkley out wide? Seems like a waste to have your best offensive player blocking when he could be catching passes. A lot of it is chip and releases and the times yeah. when the blitz doesn't end up coming, then he just releases into the round. There have been, I would say a solid amount of plays this year where that has happened, where he scans, sees that the blitzers backed off in the zone. Then now he's the check down option. <laughs> I'd rather have Saquon Barkley acting in that manner than let's say a Josh Azudu if he was healthy. I would be interested to see though, them just like throwing that out and being like, all right, this has been okay. We're not really moving the ball on offense. Let's just line them out wide and have an extra receiver and go empty a little bit more often. That's another thing we haven't talked about, or I didn't talk about the last one. They asked like, what can the coaches do more? One thing I would like to see a lot more of is empty. I remember during Jones's rookie season, empty worked really well. It's still all quick game. Like it's fine. You just get rid of the football, but empty. And it doesn't even have to be all quick game. They ran some empty with Shermer. That was like, you know, those half field high, high read high to low. And he would read high and he would throw high. And like, it's quick. The ball's out of his hands in 1.5 seconds, but it's a deep, deeper throw because you know, it's tougher to defend when everybody's out and routes empty. And if you put Saquon Barkley on the line of scrimmage lined up to the lined up a little wider, it does force the defense to move a linebacker out there or a safety or whatever it may be. Yeah. You don't have the guy helping the block and chip and release and our offensive line stinks, but just get rid of the ball fast. That would be the only thing. It's like Daniel Jones, you need to get rid of the ball because I don't trust this giant's offensive line in a five man protection. And I also don't really think Saquon Barkley is that good of a receiver. Either. That's the other issue. Yeah. That's that is, that is an issue. Like the one thing, man, though, that would have been great. Do you remember? I can't remember exactly what game. I think it was the Detroit game when they did align an empty and Saquon Barkley was, I think, like the number two in a three by two set. And he ran that deep over route and he was yep. freaking wide open. Wide Jones, open. Jones I think, they had to come back to that route. Yeah. I mean, I mean you would have to catch him. Right him. Deep. He was literally wide open on a deep over and Jones just like didn't see it and threw some, some underneath drag or whatever. But I mean, the same concept. The same concept happened against Philadelphia this week on the 37 yard catch by Darius Slade. Yeah. That was, it wasn't Saquon Barkley. It was, uh, I, I can't, it wasn't Isaiah Hodgins either, but it was some receiver. He just ran a quick hitch. Darius Slade bit down. And then from the backside, you isolated basically against a safety robbing Darius Slayton against that guy. And there was no one in the deep third. So the Giants sprung a big play. And I know it was in garbage time, but it's something that I felt like, or I feel like Mike Kafka has dialed up a couple times, those backside drag and those backside overs on, on Y cross. But whenever that opposite cornerback doesn't sink, Jones needs to recognize that and throw it. And there have been times this season where either he didn't have time to do it or he just didn't see it. And he went with the check down. Yeah, completely agree. Um, so we'll see what happens there, but that'll be interesting if they do work that in more. Danny Dimes season asks, are there any good interior offensive linemen the Giants can add in free agency? So for me, I looked at this first, Danny Dimes. To me, there's one guy that stands out by far above the rest. I think there's some retreads in there that are kind of like a Glowinski type that I wouldn't want to invest in. But there's one super really interesting, talented player coming off his rookie deal who's been used at like four different positions on his offensive line, which hasn't helped him. He's had injuries, all things that I love, because I think if you put him in at center or guard, he'll find his home and just let him stay at one position. He'll find his home and become like a top 10 or top 15 player in his position. I actually think he has top five, top 10 upside from the little bit I've seen. Um, there was actually a block I saw two weeks ago or three weeks ago on Sunday night football where he, I'm trying to just give all these hints in case Nick can guess who I'm going to talk about <laughs> in a second, where he made a phenomenal block pulling from right to left and then got called for a ridiculous penalty. It was just a horrific call. Um, and that player is Nick. 
I it's on the tip of my tongue because I know the exact block you're talking about. It's yeah. the kid from the Packers, Elgin yep. Jenkins. Yeah, you I, got that, it. You know, I don't think they're letting him out of Green Bay. They might have to based on their cap situation. Uh, dude, he's he's literally if the Giants could get Elgin Jenkins, that's that would be such a home run. But he yeah. would also, I think, command like top of the market. Oh, big money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huge he, deal. They get Elgin Jenkins, say goodbye to Saquon Barkley. And quite frankly, I'm okay with that. Yeah, he if he can stay healthy, and I'm pretty sure he he's dealt with like little injuries here and there. Yeah. I think he had one serious one, but and when he made had him been play on, like four different positions on that line. And he's insane. He was insane coming out of the draft. Yeah, and he fell a little loved bit. him coming out of that draft. No, I would, I would, oh, dude, I would love draft, to have him. Say. Yeah. So that's our guy, Danny Dimes, Elgin Jenkins. I would be perfectly fine giving him a massive guard contract. Um, person that's just because look, they're only going to have two big contracts on the offensive line coming up, Andrew Thomas, and then it would be Jenkins. And I'm okay spending two massive chunks of the cap on the offensive line. Hell, I'll spend more. I don't care. It just doesn't matter to me, really. Just get the great offensive line. I don't need to spend 15 mil at the running back position. Uh, Mark Cavallero asks, is there a strong possibility the Giants do not win another? No, he says, no, he says there is a strong possibility the Giants do not win another game this season. Putting the record slightly ahead of judges first. Looking at it holistically, what is the evidence that Brian Dable's significant upgrade to judge? Is it player development, play calling, discipline? Not saying I'm not saying he isn't. I just want your guys' view on where do you feel he is better as a coach because if the results are similar to the first year of judge and he's, and he says, I say that because a lot of us fans thought that we really liked judge after year one. Yeah. I felt like judge said everything correctly in front of the microphone, but I think there are a few, I would say big points that I appreciate about Dable a little bit more than I appreciate about judge. And I think it is in the in-game coaching decisions and the conservative nature of judge that kind of just, wore out its welcome here in New York. I think a little bit of it was he just didn't trust his team at all. I don't think he trusted his offense. I also think in his nature, being a New England guy, he was naturally a little bit more conservative. I think Brian Dable, he has had a couple conservative moments here or there, but I would like to get your opinion on this, Dan. Generally speaking, I, I don't see the same type of conservative straight play calling with Dable that we did with Joe Judge. I think that's the main thing. And then secondly, I do think the approach of Dable with his players is a much more inviting approach than Joe Judge, who tended to have a little bit more of a um, New England type of approach. You know what I'm saying? Like, I also think Brian Dable is himself, whereas Joe Judge was a little bit mechanical in front of the microphone. Not saying he was phony or fake, but I did think like he was just, this is our talking point. This is what I'm going to say to this question. Whereas Dable like goes like, eh. Then he considers the question and then he responds still kind of coach speak. But I do think in terms of the locker room, Dable's approach plays more with the players than Joe judge. Yeah, I completely agree. I think the first thing for me would be the route combinations, the difference in what we're seeing. We're actually seeing them scheme open players this year. And it's not Mike. It's Mike Kafka calling the plays. It's Brian Dable scheming the offense with Kafka's help, but it's Brian Dable scheming this up. Um, so route combinations in the past game, just night and day versus we saw during the judge era. And that can lead to points in the future. They're not leading to points right now with our current offensive line, wide receiver, quarterback combination. But at some point, when you improve that combo, you can lead to points with really good route combinations in the past game. I think also, personally, we heard a lot this year about how everything feels different, right? It's open. It's free. We're allowed to be ourselves. We're not worried about making mistakes. We didn't hear that at the beginning of the judge era. We never heard that versus the Shermer. We're just like, yeah, we like this guy. There's a bunch of BS player speak because he's they're under contract and this is their coach. But nobody wanted to run those laps. There was three guys who retired from training camp for a reason. Nobody wanted to be in that stupid ass life, like coaching style. Like, like you said, he tried to bring the New England style over. And that doesn't work with players. It's just not going to work. It works one place, New England, because Bill Belichick has the has the you know he has the track record. He's won all those Super Bowls, so basically like buy in or get the hell out. And I'll just cite. And he doesn't really care about per cycling through personnel. He's given away a lot of his best players to free agency and to trades. Belichick, so he also has that going for him. But I think it does feel different. I feel like you're right, Nick. He is more of himself, Dable. The players actually feel comfortable being themselves. It's more of an inviting environment here than it was with Joe Judge. But for me, a lot of it has to do with just I believe in his ability once he gets better personnel to, to invigorate a pass offense. I agree with that, too. I wasn't even really looking at Jason Garrett as the variable here, too. Like, yeah, the red zone efficiency of Mike Kafka 
and Jason Garrett. That, that there's a huge difference mm-hmm. in the creativity used in the red zone to score touchdowns. And I also like how this coaching staff, in my opinion, is doing a much better job than the previous coaching staff using Daniel Jones's legs. True. I think on the flip side of that argument, you could say, well, Daniel Jones was hurt every year in the NFL. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. But I do. I don't believe Daniel Jones is the type of quarterback that you can consistently win with if you don't leverage his athletic ability because it's his probably best trait. Yeah, and I think that's another great point. This is one thing you can also look at is why can we you know, view this first year better than the judge year and why can we have some hope is this coaching staff, Dable is the main culprit for this, maximize Daniel Jones. I mean, he may not have the best stats of his career right now. I don't know what the stats look like, but this is by far and away the best Jones has ever played. Don't point me to the 2019 season just because he had 24 touchdowns, 12 interceptions. He dominated three, he had three games where he dominated that season. They were all against defenses that were either, had either given up like Washington in that second game in 2019 on their coach or just badass, bad, terrible defense. When he faced like the Vikings that year and all the good defenses, he threw for like 150 with like two interceptions each game and like fumbles. And so this is the best version of Jones I've ever seen by far on tape. And he did it in one year working with him. So that would be probably even bigger than the route combinations or anything else we've mentioned, just how much he's really improved the quarterback, whoever that quarterback may be. We're talking Daniel Jones in this instance, but I think he'd be able to do that with basically any quarterback he gets his hands on. And Dan, I think it's just wild that back in Daniel Jones's second season, even his first season, it was like, yeah, there's really no weapons for this guy to throw to. And we're still having that same exact conversation. And it's like we've said several times, it's not for a lack of trying, but it's just yeah. really crap luck and some just really dumb investments. Yeah, bad evaluations are mostly it. I don't even think luck is as big a factor. As well, bad Wanda evaluation. Robinson torn ACL. And, yeah, and that's the one. Right? Holiday yeah. was a horrific evaluation. They got the yeah. results on the hip surgery, signed him anyway. Galladay, I mean, uh, Tony, beyond bad uh, yeah. you know, by them. And, the same, and some people say the same thing with Jerry Reese, but just instead of that versus the offensive line, which is something I've always disagreed with. They point to like, he did Pew, he did Richburg, he did Flowers. Well, that was over an 11-year span. He didn't consistently draft all linemen in rounds two, three, four. He, that was always my argument. If you look at those draft classes, he did not consistently draft on day three and on day two, the offensive lineman. He's, he took some big swings on horrible evals with Flowers and stuff, but he didn't take the consistent, you know, keep replenishing offensive line approach, especially from like the 2007 to like 2000, like 10 range where like all the guys were starting to get older. I didn't feel like he right. had a lot of draft picks. I'm like, I'm trying to go through my head right now. And then he started, he was like, okay, I need to start getting guys. He selected Will Beatty out of UConn and, and did things like that. But there was a large chunk when the offensive line was still good, where they weren't replenishing these aging offensive linemen with younger talent. And right. I feel like it was just kind of forced towards the end of like, you know, 2011, 2012, 2013. Yep. Completely agree with you on that. Okay. Brian Heafy asks, Matt Jones is pissed at Matt Patricia and Joe Judd's play, play calling. Uh, Matt Patricia is clearly not cutting it as an OC. Mac may be pounding the table with his agent to getting out of New England. Belichick clearly is trying to help Judge and Patricia become more equipped on the offensive side of the ball to get hedge coach positions. This is his theory, by the way. This is Brian's yeah. theory. Um, he says, with Matt Patricia failing and Joe Judge in position to take the helm and take over as offensive coordinator, and he's, quote, unquote, willing to run through a wall for Daniel Jones, is there a world where we can tag Daniel Jones and trade him for Mac Jones on a rookie deal so that we can reserve more resources and cap space for addressing other major holes on the roster? I think there's certainly a world where Joe Judge is going to attempt to get Daniel Jones. And that goes to the thing we've been talking about. What's the market? If that is the case, there's going to be a market for Daniel Jones. In terms of the Giants trading and getting Mac Jones, I get the rookie contract. I don't know how much I would want Mac Jones right now. I like the rookie contract, but I kind of feel like it would just be like, okay, we're going to bring this kid in. And I don't know if I want Mac Jones to be the quarterback of the New York Giants for the future. I just feel like he is a less athletic version of Daniel Jones with a worse arm. Yeah, he definitely has a worse arm than Jones. He's definitely less athletic. I think he's a better processor than Jones. I think that's uh, but, fair. Yeah, but that's not enough because his arm talent is worse and his legs are worse. Uh, so I definitely don't want Mac Jones. Now, the interesting side of this is if Joe Judge, and I think Belichick would, would probably be a decent fan of Jones too. If Joe Judge and, and Belichick are super in on Jones, maybe you can tag and trade him and get like a second rounder or something if you are planning to move on from Daniel Jones. So that's something interesting to consider. Like if there is a market from Jones and you don't believe in him, if you're Joe Shane, maybe you still tag him anyway, just so you can trade him. I think it would work in New England. I think like his like 
you know, I just show up to work. I don't say anything controversial. I, I just stand in front of the microphone and I sound like Eli Manning type of approach would play in New England. I think and, it would look a lot like it looks like this year with Mac Jones and, and Zappy. I think it would be pretty similar to the last couple of years. Now, I'm talking about just like his personality. Oh, the personality would be perfect yeah. for Belichick, but I think I, the I, results would be pretty similar. I'm wondering if they would, or if Joe Judge would have learned from, I guess you could say his past mistakes, and they would attempt to incorporate much more plays that would use his <laughs> athletic ability. I, I don't know. We'll see. It's Joe Judge. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> <say that. laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's definitely interesting though, Brian. I'm, 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 I'm excited for the off season just to see how all this plays out. It's going to make for great radio. Yep. Um, all things giants asks if you're each the GM. So I want answers from both of you of 26 and eight, Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley. You can only resign one. Let's say hypothetically, who's your choice. What's the contract length and what's your plan to replace the one you let walk? Yeah. So I think Dan and I are going to be lockstep here. I'll go yeah. first though. We're going to resign Daniel Jones to a shorter deal, maybe three years, but you can get out of it after one. Um, maybe like what, 25 a year, something around there. And then I would let Saquon Barkley walk and spend a day three pick on it. Maybe a day two pick if there's someone you really freaking love like a Brees Hall. Yeah, I, it's, I would love to offer something different, but this is the exactly what I think, which even makes it like as far as confirmation bias goes, this makes me even feel more strongly that we're right about this, Nick, and that there's not many other options that are plus EV. It's fine. They're going to resign Barkley, in my opinion. I think it's just coming. But I don't know how plus EV the move is, if I'm going to be let's, honest. Let's play that out, Dan. Let's play that out. Yeah. The Giants let Jones walk, and they re-sign Saquon Barkley, and then they draft a quarterback, presumably. like If you want to go that route. Now you have a rookie quarterback. You have Saquon Barkley. That's great. But by the time that rookie quarterback is up to speed, Saquon Barkley is going to be, what, two years older? Yeah. 28. All those injuries in his past. He has, what, like 250 carries already this season or 290 touches already this season. I mean, he's likely going to wear down his best trait as a running back is his burst and his athletic ability, which wanes through time. I just don't know. As you said, is that a possible, is that a possible EV move for the New York Giants? It's not it. Look, to be quite frank with everyone here, it doesn't feel very positive EV to sign Barkley at all to us. Um, we understand he was great earlier in the year, but you're not looking for a six game sample size. You're looking for the whole thing. Uh, so I don't know, man, but for me, it's definitely resign Jones over Barkley um, out of those two for sure. And my plan to replace him is the exact same as Nick's. I don't I don't need uh, I'd be so mad if we tried to replace him with like Josh Jacobs in free agency or like, you know, something stupid like that. Signing a free agent back. I do not. I want to go to the well in the draft over and over and over again with day two and day three running backs, mostly day three. Just yeah. keep pounding them because when you find them, they're under contract for four years at one mil against the cap, fewer than one mil. It's like 880K against the cap. Damian Pierce, Khalil Herbert. If I actually pulled up the last 10 drafts, I could read off 20 names, I'm sure, who, who are interesting at running back. Now, some of them may not be good anymore because they've been injured, but that's the whole point, right? The position gets injured. It has a short shelf life. Why are we investing guaranteed money against the cap in it? Ding, ding, ding. Uh, so... It is what it is. This is one that I feel very confident in. So I'm probably not going to move off of it. I may sound like I know it all on this one. doesn't mean I know it all, but it just means I'm very confident in my opinion of it. And I'm not going to be moved off of it because it's not a good position to invest in no matter who it is. Um, so let's do uh, And it, it's going to happen. So it's okay. I'll get you. Yeah, I'll read this one. Joel Cam asks, what do you guys think happens to Leo? He's a great player, but I think with the cap hit Dexter's extension and needs, he might get cut. Can can we replace Leo with a vet and a, another rookie at interior defensive line? Ironically, a potential free agent, lower cost replacement is a guy by the name of Dalvin Tomlinson. Yeah, Joel. So actually, because they were forced to restructure the contract, his 2023 cap number is 33 million, which is, I think, like the third highest non paid or third highest paid non quarterback, which obviously I can understand why you would say, should we cut him and replace him with a Tomlinson? But unfortunately, it also includes, because he was forced to restructure this contract thanks to Gettleman's terrible, horrific management of this roster. Permanent. Say it again. <laughs> Permanent real estate. He'll have it for life. Um, they can't really cut him because they would take on $21 million in dead cap just to cut him. So you're pay you would basically be paying $21 million to not be on the team, saving about $11 million. But I don't think, and like maybe you can get Tomlinson for that $11 million number, but I'd rather have Leonard Williams 
for 11 million than Tomlinson for 11 million, right? So you should only view this as 11 million, basically. That's what Leonard Williams cost the Giants next year because the 20 is already on the books. They cannot get out of the 20 million of his $33 million salary cap hit. So that's set. It's done. 20, it's 20.5. It's done no matter what. But they could, you know, use that extra. I think it's like 12.5. And yeah, Tomlinson could be 12.5, but he's not going to be too much less than that. So I'd rather just use that 12.5 on Leonard. And just to kind of hammer the point home of the permanent real estate that is residing in one Dan Schneier's head, Kenny Galladay's dead cap contract they want to get out of next year. It's like 14.7 million. Yeah. So you're talking about that one though. They'll have to eat that one. And then that exactly. cap number, the so dead if they cap eat number. that one though, they're not eating the Leonard Williams yeah. as well. Like there's it's no way they're going that yeah. Dalvin Tomlinson though, to Dalvin Tomlinson's point, like Dalvin Tomlinson signed a contract that was, I think around 11, 12 or something like that. If I'm not mistaken. Right. Right. I think it was two years, years, 22 mil with Minnesota. Yeah. Two years, 22 mil. He's 28 years old right now. He's still playing a good amount of snaps. So he already has 404 snaps this season, 20 pressures, two sacks, still doing Dalvin Tomlinson things. Absolute stud, but I don't know if he would command 12 mil. That, that'd that be interesting. That'd be interesting. I think I'd still rather have Leonard Williams at a, around the same price. Oh yeah. As, yeah. as would I definitely, he's yeah. much, even more if it's here. like only a few million less for, for Tomlinson, I prefer Leonard, I think, but it's just the situation they're in. And after that, the year after, they have only like a 5.4 million dead cap of Leonard. So he'll be cut in 2024 almost, almost certainly, I would think. I believe that's a void year, too. Yep, true. Yeah. So we have a question from Mike KG. With how poor the 2023 wide receiver free agent class is, should the Giants just focus on drafting one or two wide receivers? I'm assuming he means not signing any weapons and use the cap on interior offensive line and cornerback. Or should they try a trade since it was a pretty popular route in the offseason? We touched on the trade part yet in yesterday's mailbag. What do you think, dude? Yeah, the trade part's interesting. Like Nick said, we have to wait to see like who's disgruntled and who which which star receivers aren't getting paid by their current teams. But I'll say this, I have not going to say exactly who, but I've heard I've heard that the Giants and or, there is serious interest between the Giants and Odell Beckham Jr. And that is a definite possibility. But he's at this point, it's, he's probably just going to wait to become a free agent. He's going to basically be the best free agent wide receiver. It's that bad of a free agent wide receiver class. So will they win a bidding war? Will they want to win a bidding war? I don't know. I've heard if he does come, it will be a package deal with Saquon Barkley. And I think that's pretty obvious. If you listen to him speak about his free agency, he's basically said, we have unfinished business, me and Barkley. I want to play with Barkley again. He's not going to sign with the Giants if they let Barkley walk. So, you know, if they sign Beckham, they sign Barkley, they sign Jones. That's when we start to talk about, well, now we might have to let Xavier McKinney go, right? Or now we might have to let Julian Love go because there's not unlimited cap space. You got to remember, Andrew Thomas and Dexter Lawrence are about to get massive market setting deals. Andrew Thomas is probably going to become the highest paid left tackle in NFL history when that contract is signed. Dexter Lawrence probably going to be paid the highest interior defensive line contract or very, right there up with the Chris Joneses of the world when that comes to fruition. When you lock in those two mega contracts and you're signing Jones and you're signing Barkley and Beckham, that's basically it. Now you're pumping cap to future years. You're done. There's no free agency. So. It might be better, like you said, Mike, to just say, screw it. Let's go to the draft for receiver. Let's hope we hit. And then we have them under contract for like a few mil against the cap. If you go to the second and third round at receiver, you get super bargain. You get like, you know, 1.2 million against the cap for four years. And you can find some good guys in that range. Oh, yeah. And just to kind of give some names from the 2023 wide receiver free agent class, you're talking about like Nelson Aguilar, Ugh. DJ Chark, Marvin Jones. Byron Pringle, Julio Gross. Jones, Alan Lazard, Juju, AJ Green, Jarvis Landry, Olamade Zacchaeus, Ashton Doolin, players like that. So Ugh. I'd be what do you want? Landry in a cheap deal. That's about it. Yeah. And that's a good way to upgrade. Landry's legit. Lot. Yeah. I haven't really watched too much of yeah. New Orleans. I feel like he's dinged up and that offense just sucks too. Yeah. All right. Definitely not a cop says, can you explain the difference between slot and outside corner? Seems that outside is easier to play with the boundary, yet all the rookie and undersized guys get lumped in as slot. What traits are more important at either position? Yeah, I think for the slot, it's better when you're just more agile. You have better movement skills, looser hips because you have two-way go. Yep. It's difficult for smaller guys to play on the outside because typically outside receivers, the traditional X receiver in a Don Coriel type offense is going to be six foot three, six foot four. You line five foot. 10 Darnay Holmes with 28 and a half inch arms up against those guys. That is a huge 
huge mismatch. So outside corners typically are longer. They're typically a little bit more physical. They can press you up at the line of scrimmage, whereas slot guys are just a little bit more agile, a little bit more athletic in the lower half in terms of their ability to flip their hips and cover in space. And in today's NFL, like this stuff is evolving, right, Dan? Mm -hmm. Like slot corners is becoming like a big thing, right? So if you have the ability and you have the feet and you have the hips and you have the discipline and the eyes to align in the slot, you could be a great outside cornerback. You could have all the length and you could be physical. But if you also possess those other things, you might get stuck in the slot with the proliferation of 11 personnel and the fact that a lot of offenses are align aligning, you know, receivers like Larry Fitzgerald and, and all of these really star studded wide receivers in the slot. So I do feel like there is a, some sort of evolution going on, but those would be, I think the two primary traits to differentiate between the outside cornerback and the slot position. I agree. And I also think the original question by definitely not a cop, I think he's right in his assertion that it does seem like it's easier to me, at least to play outside than the slot because the two way goes like when you're playing in the slot, the receiver has two, two way, a two way go on every route. When you're playing in the, and on the back, I know you have more help too. You have more middle. Yeah, that's help. yeah. That's yeah. what I was going to say. You you have help typically from the safeties, depending on the right. coverage. You have guys to the inside. You have guys to the outside, and you know where your help is, like in zone versus covers. being on an island. Yeah, it is definitely versus, probably harder for that reason still to be the boundary corner. But I mean, yeah, it's perspective, and it also depends yeah. on coverage. Like if you're in Wink Martindale scheme, you're in the slot. Yeah, you're playing man a ton <laughs> in this slot. That's tough. That's why I look at Darnay Holmes, and I'm not the biggest Darnay Holmes guy, but I'm like, bro. They asked this guy to align across from CD Lamb in the slot how many times? Like, yeah. that is such a difficult task. It is. It is. Okay. Another question from Brian Heafy, who says, another long-term vision question, but how many years would Jerome Henderson need to spend under Wink to call his system? I see Henderson as an intriguing defensive coordinator prospect for the long haul. I don't think you're crazy because he said, am I crazy at the end of the question? But I don't really know how to fully quantify how many years he needs within a system. He seems to be a really, really good defensive backs coach. I don't know if he has aspirations to be a defensive coordinator, but if he does, I'm sure he would do an excellent job once he is up to speed. But I don't even know if he would call Wink Martindale's system. You know, like he could have different types of philosophies. And now he is just coaching to Wink Martindale's system because that is his defensive coordinator. Yeah, and there's also so many aspects to being a defensive coordinator that we don't really have information on. I remember listening to someone break down why Wade, they loved, um, I think it might have actually been, I think it was, yeah, it was an like interview we did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where they were talking about why he loved Wade Phillips, and it was like, Wade Phillips let all the position coaches take care of everything during the week, and he's just like, I don't care about any of this. This is my system. Just let me call the plays on Sundays. That's all he wanted to do, call the plays. And so we just don't know if Jerome Henderson would be a good play caller, and that's such a huge factor in being a defensive coordinator. Absolutely. And Brian also asked, seeing as though Kafka can scheme guys like Isaiah Hodgins open, is interior offensive line at this point more pressing than wide receiver from a draft standpoint? Um, it's a good question. I think long-term I'm pretty excited about not necessarily him being like a dominant wide receiver one or anything like that, but Wando Robinson being a contributing wide receiver. I want on the field a lot. I feel pretty decently confident about Isaiah Hodgins. I don't know. It's, it might be a little bit too much going a little overboard, but I think he can be a solid wide receiver three, four for the team. Uh, Slayton, and I, I would resign. He's still pretty young as a wide receiver three, two for me. Mm-hmm. Now you compare that with the interior offensive line. The only one I'm really excited about personally is Josh Azudu. Maybe Nick Gates, but I I like Nick Gates. I really do. But I still, and I'm fine. Like I think they can get along fine with him as a center, but I would prefer a major upgrade at center. I like to, I like center. I think center is the most underrated position in football, basically, besides maybe interior, besides maybe interior linebacker, uh, like inside linebacker when you have a really bad group there. But center to me just sets the tone for the offensive line. It can make and break offensive lines to me. And so I still want to get like a top 10 type guy there. So I don't really see much that I like on the interior offensive line from a long-term building standpoint outside of Azudu. So I would probably agree that it is a bigger need. Yeah, it's always going to come down to value, as Dan and I always say. But in terms of the way the question was phrased, I understand Mike Kafka is doing a good job scheming guys open. But Isaiah Hodgins is a little bit more, I feel like, than just a guy who is getting schemed open. Yes. Yeah, I feel like, again, man, smart, tough, and dependable. That's what Joe Shane has preached. That's what Brian Dable has preached. And I really feel like a player like Isaiah Hodgins fits every single one of those. This guy came in off of somebody else's practice squad, a six foot four, 209 pound wide receiver, and is playing the way he is playing right now. And the offense, it's not necessarily running through him, but 
He has stepped up huge in so many different situations. He has taken big hits over the middle of the field. He runs those deep dig routes and takes those hits whenever they are there. And in the quick game, he understands how to manipulate space. He has the spatial awareness yes. that I feel like Brian Dable needs in these types of receivers. I just don't think receivers like Isaiah Hodgins, and I don't, you know, I'm not saying he's TO or anything ridiculous, but you typically don't find guys like Isaiah Hodgins just chilling on people's practice squad. He was just right. buried in a very deep wide receiver room. So I think he has a place on this Giants roster. I believe he's an exclusive rights free agent next year, meaning the Giants can match any offer. So I think if the Giants want him, no one's going to go out of their way to, to, you know, throw money at Isaiah Hodgins. So like a ton of money. So I think the Giants can bring him back. And I really think Brian Dable respects him and likes his game. And I think a combination of him and Colin Johnson could be solid as depth guys next year. And we all hope that the Giants do invest and get like a prime number one type of asset for whoever is the quarterback. But I am, uh, I think I would say I would rather have upgrades at the interior offensive line, especially if the Giants are going to continue with Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Yeah, for sure. I would agree with that as well. Last question for Brian. He says, is Bobby Johnson part of the problem or is it just the lack of talent and health on the offensive line? I think it's a lack of talent and health. Look, I'm not in practice though. Like I, I can't tell you like what he's doing with his EDDs and things like that. Like I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I've heard a lot of people who I respect rave about Bobby Johnson. I liked what he has said in interviews and I just look at the personnel he's working with. And I don't believe the personnel is really up to par for, for a playoff contending team. And here we are, the New York giants, they're contending for a playoff spot. So I'm not going to hate on Bobby Johnson. I think we kind of touched on something like this in yesterday's podcast. I'm not going to hate on him, but you know, is he a top guy? No, not right now. At least it doesn't seem like it. I think that's fair. I think part of it is the talent. Part of it is just injuries. Like he's had so many guys cycling in and out of the lineup there. It's really tough when you don't have continuity on an offensive line. Okay. We have the next one from Michael Ziesman who asks, any lessons learned or opportunities to exploit we should look for from the offense based on the last commander's game? Yeah, I think Dan and I have brought this up a couple of times. They established some sort of offense in overtime by working quick game, slant flat, allow that linebacker to match the running back out of the backfield. Isaiah Hodgins comes right behind him. And that was usually on the free access to the backside of a three by one set. Sometimes they did that at two by two as well. So if you don't like what you're seeing to the front side of a three by one set and you have Matt Breida or Saquon Barkley flare, flare out to Isaiah Hodgins side, that linebacker crosses Isaiah Hodgins is just going to replace him throw into that open window. That's just operating quick game. It's nothing, right. it's nothing novel or anything like that. But I think that would be one, a way to start the offense to see if you can start moving the football. And that can also set up your rushing attack, which can hopefully set up your play action attack. And you can get into the successful offense that we saw earlier in the season. Yeah, I think you nailed that. And I think the game is something we're going to look for more shotgun, more quick game, more tempo, I would like, even though it's on the road, so that might be, not be possible. DB Football asks, is Debo droppable in redraft leagues at end of weeks? I'm Dean. Yes. Kyle Shanahan said uh, Debo is not back for at least three weeks, so I would drop him. Chris Clark says, what is the difference in skill set, if any, between a punt returner and a kick returner? That's an interesting question. So I guess I would say some differences. What kick return is a little bit more structured. Like there are lanes that you can pick and sift through. And maybe that's why we see more of a running back doing it. Whereas a pump return, there is some structure to it, but it's much more. I'm going to catch it. I'm going to read what's in front of me and I'm going to use my athletic ability to make people miss. Now there are, you know, responsibilities for, for punt teams and things of that nature. But I do believe kickoff is just a little bit more of a structured type of play. But I, I don't really know. I don't know the complete nuances though. I'll, yeah. I'll say that much. I think that's right. Plus the punt returner, there's less space to work with. So. You need sure hands for sure. Um, let's see. Clay from Brooklyn says, I see the Bucks are way over the cap for 2023, which is true. Good chance they can cut or trade Shaq Mason. I think he's a steal at 8.5 million and a huge upgrade over Glowinski. It'd free up an early pick for the other positions if we went and got him. What do you think about that potential move? <laughs> I would love that move. 8.5 yeah. million for Shaq Mason. Sign me up for that any day, Clay. Yeah, I agree with Nick on this. He'd be a nice upgrade. That's a good good thinking, Clay, and I would like that move as well. Shaq Mason on our radar in addition to Elgin Jenkins as well. Mason says, one move you regret the most from the offseason, any cut, trade, signing, et cetera. Yeah, we did this one yesterday, one similar to this. Uh, if I focus on the draft in, in yesterday's mailbag, so if we go to the free agency, I think we also touched on this. I think Mark Lewinsky would be the guy that you would say, Maybe we should have retained him, but let's flip this and make it a little bit more interesting, Dan. 
If there was somebody that the New York Giants let go from the previous regime last year, i.e. an Evan Ingram, a Will Hernandez, a player like that, who do you think would help the New York Giants so much this season? Oh, this one's easy. Yeah, that's a great great way to go with it. And I don't know if you're going to – if you set me up or if, if – if once you hear it, I'm sure you'll agree. It's the same player that we said they should have never got moved on from last offseason in the first place to create space for Kyle Rudolph and all those other idiots like Kevin Zeitler. Obviously, Kevin Zeitler is like a Pro Bowl player this year, apparently, with Baltimore. I haven't watched much Baltimore, but I see he's in the Pro Bowl running. Like, are you kidding me? Are you absolutely kidding me that we could have just Kevin Zeitler over Gowinski right now? It's just pure stupidity that they moved on from Kevin Zeitler to make room for Kyle Rudolph. So it's Zeitler for me, for sure, going back then. It's Gowinski this offseason, though. It's uh, we, what we called it at the time was coaching hubris, yeah. right? Yeah. Because the Giants, they just didn't invest in the offensive line because they had a young Matt Parrott and a young Shane Lemieux there. Well, Shane Lemieux got hurt. Matt Parrott, he got hurt at the end of the season. But thought he Will just, Hernandez flipping to the right side would fix all his issues. <laughs> exactly. And that that was uh, an egregious um, yeah. egregious mistake, un unfortunately. Now he's out here in the desert starting, I believe, yeah. which is not going well out here. Yeah, some people have like DM me like he hasn't been that bad. I'm like, I don't know. I don't watch Cardinals film. Don't give me the PFF grades. Please don't give me the PFF. Grades. <laughs> All right, John Smith says, given the sheer number of holes in the Giants roster, which holes should they look to fill through free agency versus the draft? What positions are easier to fill in free agency and which positions can you really only get elite level talent through the draft? Well, I think just by looking at the free agent, uh, potential free agents in 2023, the wide receivers, it, it looks pretty ugly. So maybe you look to invest in that in the draft. As we always said, I've always said it in this podcast, you get yeah. value, yada, yada. But I'm not opposed to veteran offensive linemen, but I'll say this. Typically, veteran offensive linemen aren't available if they're really good. And if yeah. they are, it's because they are going to cost a dick load of money. So right. you have to be willing to shell out those types of contracts. You can find solid Josh Reynolds and Mac Hollins type of receivers, but those aren't guys who are going to be your true number one. So if you want that true number one, you're going to have to get them in the draft. Doesn't need to be a top five pick. Doesn't need to be a top 10 pick. If there's anything about these recent drafts, Dan, that we've learned is you can get a Justin Jefferson at 23. You can get a Michael Pittman Jr. at the top of the second round. So you can have those talents and then you can groom them and then they can come up in this system, in Brian Dable's system and hopefully flourish by year two and maybe even in year one, as we've seen. Like, I mean, right. look at Garrett Wilson right now, right? So I would say wide receiver would be ideally more of a draft pick, but it definitely doesn't necessarily have to be just just structured that way. Yeah, and I think from a more 30,000-foot view, John, don't look at free agency as like this game where we're like, we have X amount of cap space, let's bang, bang, bang it out and sign all these guys. The bad teams are the ones who are consistently using free agency to fill their roster. It has to, You have to take a patient approach with this team, understand that if they're going to ever get this thing right, it's going to be by drafting right and then re-signing the players they draft. It's not going to be by signing all these guys in free agency. Remember the time they did that in 2016? It was uh, Janoris Jenkins, Damon Harrison, and Olivier Vernon. And it worked for one season. And then those contracts all became horrific, right? And that happens over and over again when you see teams make those decisions to go crazy in free agency. One massive free agent contract, okay, I'd be fine with that if it's the right guy, if it's an Elgin Jenkins. But for the bargains, you can look at linebacker. TJ Edwards is a free agent on Philly. They're probably not going to be able to resign him. We talked about him yesterday. I think he could be a bargain. I think you can find a bargain inside backer in free agency potentially. I think you could even potentially find a bargain safety in free agency. Not the Giants need a safety, but that's another position I think you can find bargains at. So tight end maybe, but tight end is just nothing in the NFL. There's just no talent anywhere at that, at that position, it feels like. So, yeah, mostly they just got to do this thing through the draft, and we got to be patient. This is not going to be you know, uh, an immediate fix. Okay. And I'll say this, Dan. Yeah. Competent continuity can go a long way. Right. right. So if your team and the players that you have on your team, if they're good at what they do, retaining them and allowing them to grow with each other, that can really build an organizational or an organization towards success. Uh, I don't think like just letting people go like the Giants have done. Like they they've just let so many, I would say, yeah. talented guys over the years go to free agency. I think if you do resign these guys, if they are, if you have a plan for them and they are competent, then that can just be the structure that you need to invite the TJ Edwards of the world to come into your locker room and then assimilate to your culture and how you do things. And I think the Giants have that foundation in place right now. Now, will they retain them all? Not a hundred percent sure, but competent continuity can go a long way. And it's something that the Giants really haven't. I would say had in, in quite a while since the 2000s, really, since the 2007, 2008, you know, when they had right. that off the line and everything. True. I think it's another good point. Okay. Ethioi asks, I have no idea how to pronounce this guy's name. 
E H T O H I. Ethoi ask, what are the team's three biggest needs going into the offseason? Three biggest needs going into the offseason. I think it's got to be what linebacker, <laughs> interior offensive line, and then wide receiver or cornerback. And it's difficult to really say which one it is. I would, um, I'm not really 100% certain on which one it is because you get Aaron Robinson back. What can you expect from Aaron Robinson? Cordell Flott will be another year into his development. Is Rodarius Williams a guy who's going to be on this roster? Maybe I guess I would lean towards wide receiver, but cornerback has to be in this conversation as well. And it just kind of goes to show you how much this Giants team actually still needs and the lack of depth that's actually here. Yeah, I mean, when you have the depth that they have, not only the depth, but the lack of top-end talent at corner and receiver that they have, you know how far, much further away they are than it seems because you don't win the NFL without corners and receivers these days. You need to pass the football to win the fo- these games like consistently. You can try to grind grind to something, but you need to get consistency in the pass game at some point. Um, so I would agree with Nick. It's a debate bet- with me between wide receiver and corner for the third need. I would go receiver. Um, and it's also kind of nuts because we don't even know if Daniel Jones is going to be the quarterback, and we didn't even say quarterback. So if you say Jones isn't there, then quarterback becomes a need. So it's a yeah. it's a whole freaking um. True. It could be it could be messy. Running it back could, is going to be a need, but I, that's one you could find so easy yeah. in the draft. Um, Ethoy also asks, okay, this one's for Nick. What's your favorite army story? No, uh, <laughs> oh my God, Dan, come on. <laughs> this your favorite military story. I don't know, uh, Ethoy. I have I have plenty of plenty of stories from in country and out of country. I guess maybe I could, I could tell like a quick funny one. So first I should probably go over how the chain of command is set up. So I was in first battalion, six Marines infantry unit within a battalion. You have three line units. So when first battalion, six Marines, it was Alpha company, Bravo company, Charlie company. Then you have H and S and then you have weapons company. Why am I telling you all this? Well, <laughs> I'm telling you all this because one time when I was boot as boot, so that means I was new. I was like 19 years old. I was at a boot camp. I was in the fleet with two of my buddies, Kang and Bill Lobos. We were walking to the shower. And something that's pretty common for enlisted people to do is they mock their officers. So the Italian commander, this guy's in charge of 16. He's been in the military for, I don't know, 15 to 20 years. He's a lieutenant colonel. He had a pretty distinct voice, right? So. There's a sergeant major underneath him. This guy's an enlisted guy, probably been in the military for 20, 20 plus years. He naturally is subservient to the battalion commander. So boot Nick Filato and his two boot friends were in AP Hill in this place called Tent City. And we were walking to the shower. We're walking and we're mocking our CO. We're mocking our battalion commander. And we are definitely mocking our sergeant major, who is naturally subservient to said CO. And we're saying some stuff that I'm not going to repeat on this podcast, (laughs) but we were doing it and it was nighttime, luckily. And we rounded a corner heading to the shower and lo and behold, crossing our face as we round the corner is the sergeant major and every battalion first sergeant right next to him. (laughs) And My butthole got so freaking tight. All three of our buttholes were air freaking tight because this guy had to have heard us do either the lieutenant colonel's voice, who had a very distinct voice, or his voice mocking him, right? And we just kept walking so fast because this dude was walking and he just slowly turned and just looked at us. And if he actually hurt us, we would have been screwed. Like it would have been terrible. Like we would have, our lives would have been absolutely hell. I don't think we would have got NJP'd even though we were mocking. We were just having fun at their expense, which is something that's very common for enlisted people to do, as I said. But man, we were, uh, we still talk about that story sometimes. It was, um, it was definitely a doozy. I would say that much. There are, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of things I could probably say that, um, that would be entertaining, but maybe for another time. Maybe for another time. Someone asked that question again because I I enjoy hearing all of these, and I could never get Nick to talk about his military experience. The only time I really ever talk about it is when I made the mistake earlier, and I used to call I didn't used to. I like one time called it the Army by mistake, which is one of the most offensive things you can say to a Marine, I think. Yeah, I mean, we're just not the Army. I mean, we've done this before. <laughs> That's like me don't saying, act like, like you're not offended by Don't act like you're not better than the Army. <laughs> like, I'm not taking shots at the I'm army. Kidding, by the way, we probably have yeah. tons of people here who served in the army. I, 
honestly, anyone who's served, from what I've heard, the little that Nick has shared with me, for anyone who has served in the Army or Marines or whatever it may be, you guys have a service that is incredible to this country. I can't even imagine my loser self in some of these situations, like how big of a, a B-I-T-C-H I might be. And maybe I would rise to the occasion and be a stronger person. I don't know. But it sounds really tough, and it sounds like you guys go through a lot. So um, definitely thank you to everyone who does I was only joking because yeah. in the past I had called – I had been like, oh, tell me about this and this. And I'd say army just because it was like in my head or whatever. And it was like first thing to think of instead of military or Marine. And Nick was like, no, 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 no. I'm a Marine. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't know this going into boot camp, but you don't call Marines soldiers. So what do you call them? Call Marines. You and I didn't call know them soldiers. That. Okay. So that's no, another not, thing. You don't we're call not them. soldiers. No, you can call we're them military. Not. Yeah. Okay. We're not soldiers. We're freaking Marines. And I didn't realize okay. that until I got to boot camp and it gets drilled into your head by your Okay. My drill instructor is pretty hard, like you know, freaking soldier, like you know. And I was just like, oh, I always like the American Soldier by Toby Keith. I, I like that song, like <laughs> you know, like silly, stupid, like 18, 17, you know, however old I was. But, it's yeah. amazing, like what you would know and wouldn't know. Like some of the things, like one just little small thing that Nick told me like a few weeks ago that I didn't know is like, and it just shows how little you know if you're not part of the experience and you're not, you know, serving your country. Like I didn't. I didn't know you went to, like you during boot camp. You get no time to yourself. Like Nick is like, you can't even talk to your friends. Like, you can't even say like, what's up and like dap them up or something. It's like no. no time whatsoever, bro. They like in the military, they basically, <laughs> they remove every aspect of your life it's crazy. and they indoctrinate you into the person that they want you to be. Right. And you're not even a person. Like you can't even say, I want to do this. You have to say this recruit in boot camp. Okay. Like you're, you're, a, you speak in the third you speak person, the third person. Interesting. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like even when you get to the fleet, when you're not even in boot camp, Dan, like you can't walk and drink out of a bottle at the same time. Like you can't put your hands in your pockets, like weird stuff. Like if you dare you to get caught wearing white socks, you get your ass <laughs> wiped out. Like just really like stuff that you'd be like, why? And it's just like, that's just the way it is, man. Yeah. That's the standard that is being upheld by the United States Marine Corps. Yeah. Right. And so those are the type of things I feel like I would make the mistake on. I'd wear the white socks and I'd be like getting hit. I'd be like, uh, not nah, I didn't say that. I'd be like getting reprimanded. reprimanded. I'd be so bad. I'd be the worst soldier ever. Soldier. Well, I mean, you wouldn't be in the Marines if you were a soldier. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> I could actually pull it off if I actually like got my mind right about it. But um, and obviously you did. Like you knew what you were getting yourself into. I'm sure to some extent. Um, obviously yeah. some of it I'm sure was new for you. But yeah, it was a great story from the Marines. I can only imagine being in that spot, like making fun of somebody who I know is above me, who I know if he heard it, I'm gonna get screwed. I'm surprised you didn't get like any kind of like reprimandation or anything. I guess Bro, just, we just kept walking. It was it was yeah, night. Sometimes you just get lucky. You didn't hear you. You got very yeah. lucky. <laughs> I know, dude. And like the thing is, like the the battalion commanders, like he had such a distinct voice. So like when you mocked it. Like he would like, there's no way you would know that. Yeah. Like, that's what you're doing. That he knows it's him and he's of been mocked course. before. He's heard it from others. And then like the, the voice we would use for the Sergeant Major was just like, Oh yeah, yes, sir. Oh yes. Like, <laughs> like such like a, like a subservient little bitch. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and like we were doing that right in front of him. He was right around the corner and he oh had all the God. first sergeants around him. If they realized all of them looking up to the Sergeant Major, cause they're beneath the Sergeant Major, right. they would have freaking been like these boot ass dumb lance corporals we're gonna right. freaking light these kids out oh man it would have been a wreck <laughs> all right last question here from luna 5x how do the giants score more points than the opposing team that's how you win football games luna that's what herm edwards says right yeah. you play to win the game play to win the game and how do you win the game you score more points mike mcdaniel had a funny uh thing this where he was talking about yeah i think in the cold you score less but you should try to score more and then you should try, always try to score more points than the opposing team so yeah big fan it's a fun question to end on. We had a little bit of a spiral here with the military stuff and then this or Marine stuff. You're not military, you're Marines. Um, so the few, the proud. What was what did I used to think it was? The few, the proud, the many. The few, the proud, the many. I don't know how you can even like do that. Like, like coming out of your mouth, you have to be like, what am I saying? Like these are contrasting. The few, things. the proud, the many. It makes no sense. Few and many in the same sense. It makes absolutely, I almost, it does if you're thinking like once a Marine, always Marine, right? There's only a few of us now, but like, you know, in our current unit, but if you're part Marine, you're always part of the many. <laughs> Is that what you thought when you first I guess it? so. I guess that's what I originally thought. You could say. <laughs> it must be what I originally thought. The few, the that's proud. That's hilarious, man. What's the final one? The few, the proud, the what? A few just the proud the Marines. The Marines. Yeah. Okay, yeah, just a few the proud the Marines. Okay, yep. all right. Well, I like it. Anyway, thanks again to everybody tuning in. Big Blue Panther went off the rails a bit at the end. Hope you enjoyed this mailbag part two. Um, we will speak to you soon. Hopefully, the Giants can get this win and get back on track with the playoffs.